And welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Going for Two, presented by Home Field Apparel. I am your host, Matt Brown. I am the publisher of the Extra Points newsletter. I do things across the D1 ticker extended universe. I am joined here, as always, by Brian Fisher, my colleague and co-host. How you doing, man? I am still recovering from a, a crazy sports calendar, man. Everything seems to be happening all at once. We, we got crazy March Madness going on, the, the return of F1. We got uh, soccer out the wazoo. Like it, it, It's a fun time of the year for, for a sports fan, and especially so in the college basketball space after uh, what, a, what a wild first weekend of the tournament. It was a great first weekend of the of the tournaments, really, right? right? Like right. We, we had – this is maybe my first year of getting more invested in the women's basketball side in part because both of my alma maters – Oh, I guess you can't really count American as an alma mater. I didn't graduate, but both the schools I went to were in this tournament. Uh, American, unfortunately, was uh, destroyed by Michigan in the first round, but but Ohio State did make the Sweet 16. Uh, a, a very fun men's tournament, culminating with. Be honest with me here. What, did you have you heard of St. Peter's before this turn before the tournament? The only reason I had heard of St. Peter's was because I watched some of the MAC uh, conference tournament a little bit, and uh, I knew that I- Iona got upset, so it was kind of like wide open in, in terms of the field. So I was like, "All right, well, maybe maybe some of these other schools." So like, and, and that plus you're like all the conference realignment, you know, talk you have with with folks around, the, you kind of get a sense of like, "All right, th- these schools are are in this this league," and so I think that is the only reason why I guess they were on my radar. But if I had if you told me where to like. You know, put it put a pin in the map and, and try to find the school. There, there was absolutely no way I would have known that, even though I've probably driven driven by you know St. Peter's a, a couple times. I, I feel like I am in the the top one percent of following conference. Um, we have tried to do a lot of mid major and NCAA tournaments related content throughout the Collegiate Sports Connect, throughout Extra Points, throughout our, the rest of the work that we're doing today. I wanted I wanted to talk about something a little bit different. From a, a new story that uh, that dropped last week, that we we didn't quite have a chance to get into, but but does impact mid majors as well as high majors. Um, Navigate, a, a uh, research firm that touches a lot of stuff in collegiate athletics, a group that we've, we've talked to a couple of different times, published the study last week. This was on um, it's on the fourteenth, so last Monday they published a study projecting what future conference distributions were going to look like. We're going to, we're going to include the navigate study here in the show notes um, the, for power five conference distributions through, through next year through 2029, which is important because the big 10 the PAC 12 and the big 12 are going to go to market during that period. Their study showed that by the end of the decade, the sec would be distributing over a hundred million dollars per school in U S currency. With the Big Ten, sure, you know, not far behind them at 94. The Big Ten would jump the SEC uh, in 2024 because they're going to go to market first. Then, presumably, when Texas and Oklahoma join the mix, uh, that number would change. Those numbers are huge, but not super shocking, I think, to maybe those of us who live in this world. Maybe the more surprising thing were the numbers projected for everybody else with the Pac 12, ACC, and Big 12 all lumped up close together in the 56 to $52 million ish range. Um, All all three showing some growth over the decade, but at a much flatter curve than the other two. So we've already heard that the power five is secretly a power two and everybody else just from a pure revenue distribution from this estimate that that becomes very, very stark. I'm reading this correctly uh, in your opinion. Yeah, I think the the eye opening you know figures that uh, are, are tossed around is what really kind of got social media and, and and a lot of fans kind of caught up in in terms of the, just the general numbers there. Um, and, and I mean, look, you know, you talk about the NFL, you know, raking in over ten billion dollars a year. That that's three billion at least, you know, for just the Big Ten and the SEC, you know, per per year in conference payouts. You know, that that is kind of where the market sees these media rights going, which is, is obviously a lot. And I think the, the concern for a lot of folks is just the gap between them and the rest of the pack, not just in the, in the power five, but you gotta, you gotta imagine, like you're talking about schools that are, are 
taking in more than the lifetime of these contracts for some of these group of five leagues, you know? And so I think there's oh, yeah. certainly a concern in terms of the, the, uh, the level playing field, not being quite so level like it once was, which let's face it, it never has been uh, a truly level play, playing field. But I think the, the unevenness that uh, people see the, these massive increases coming is, is uh, certainly palp- palpable when you talk with folks, you know, around the industry went around college athletics. And uh, I mean, there is some, some real, uh, you know, focus on those numbers, but uh, I think SEC fans understand, uh, seeing that that number tick past the Big Ten, and uh, that's something that will sure to be, bring a smile to to a lot of their faces, not just in terms of their their dollars and cents, and, and that uh, those FRS reports and those the, those final figures, but uh, it could have some some big impacts. I think across the college athletics landscape, um, when you have these two just so far out ahead of everybody else. Yeah, it, it's no accident that we're talking about this again in a world where almost every basic assumption about college athletics is being challenged. Whether it makes sense to have Maybe two conferences that are distributing a hundred million freaking dollars before anybody sells a ticket. It makes sense to have them in the same organizational sphere as St. Peter's, which might sell a couple hundred tickets to a basketball game in, in, in a new renovated nice arena. Um, but clearly not not the same final. Um the neither of us can predict exactly what the world is going to look like in 2020. And uh, Navigate, I think it was pretty upfront about, hey, here are some of the assumptions and the, you know, how we've built in our model to help us better understand where these media rights valuations are going, how they got to this figure, where this all, what this all means. Uh, we actually have somebody from Navigate who helped work on the study that we're going to bring onto the show here. We're going to share some of this on Collegiate Sports Connect. Um, so instead of us just uh, speculating in front of a line graph for 45 minutes, we can have some more expert knowledge. So let's, uh, why don't we go ahead and, and bring in Matt right now uh, and talk through this a little bit. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for taking some time here to chat with uh, Brian and I here for Going for Two and Collegiate Sports Connect. It is a, it's a pleasure to be able to get a little bit more context behind uh, your report and your numbers. Yeah, happy to, happy to do it. Always fun to chat about what we're working on. So thank you. I, the the first question I, I would I'd love to to talk about here is to talk about the, the projections here for for Big Twelve revenue over time. Uh, I, I I was a little bit surprised myself to see that that number seemed to be you know relatively static and even would go up over the course of the decade, despite the Big 12's membership uh, changing dramatically. And I, I, we had we had uh, you know talked to ads and talked to people in the television industry. Uh, you know, last summer and, the, and, and you know, as conference realignment was stabilizing and the feedback that Brian and I heard was the Big 12 tier one rights are not as valuable uh, without Texas and Oklahoma uh, as, as they were beforehand. Can, can you tell us a little bit about why you see those numbers not dipping substantially over the next mm-hmm. decade? Yep. Yeah. Happy to uh, fill in that. So with the Big 12, I mean, we know it's no secret that losing Texas and Oklahoma will take a big bite out of average viewership of those of those conference games. Um, but with the marketplace we're in and the appreciation of sports rights in general, we think a combination of just that raw appreciation of what rights are worth, plus bringing in those four new institutions to kind of build the gap, that kind of makes them back whole so that you see sort of a gradual increase you know, albeit pretty light over time, um, sort of countering that dip. But what you what you see by that also is the SEC has a pretty big jump, followed by another big jump. And that's really the the dollars related to Texas and Oklahoma, carrying with them such large viewership. So now you've really got the SEC stealing the bump from what the Big 12 probably would have seen to to kind of widen the gap. So combination of rights being worth a lot, especially today, and especially as they continue to be, um, uh, you know, what the most sought after type of programming, Um, but getting those other four schools who, you know, are pretty solid schools, we think will have um, a good impact and and keep them whole and, and grow a little bit over time. You, you have included in here uh, your projections based on an 18 playoff. I'm curious why you guys went with that model since all the talk has been with 12. And and what, ultimately, what kind of bump could these schools see if they go from 8 to 12 and bring in those additional revenues? Yeah. Um, you know, we stuck with 8 just, uh, 
you know, we know 12 was something largely talked about. And then, um, you know, we took a couple steps back with how everything played out publicly. Um, so we just wanted to stay conservative because we think these numbers just on the surface are pretty high numbers. So saying, hey, look, we're even going to stick with eight to be conservative and kind of share where we think things are going. Um, with 12, I think, you know, some some questions, I think, become more important to answer with 12. Obviously, how those auto bids are are aren't happening, um, but also just the way the CFP money is split up. I think we had some forecasts this time last year that said, hey, this 12 team model could could result in a two billion dollar a year payout with a B, right? And so I think with those numbers for a 12 team, um, I think we might have to revisit sort of just how the payouts work. I mean, today with the with the four team, there's a 60, 70 million fixed amount that goes to each of the power conferences and some smaller amounts to other conferences. And then there's a leftover variable piece that sort of gets paid out based on which, which um, round you make it to. Um, but, you know, imagine a 12 team with, um, you know, sometimes in some cases having three teams in maybe four, yeah. um, are you going to reward a, a school that doesn't advance the same as one that gets to the championship? So you get, you know, and a championship game having way more viewership than a first round game, but the first round games being no slouch themselves. So I think you'd have to really think about how that payout plays out, but certainly, you know, we're talking, I think another five to 10 million per school per year of the 12 team versus uh, the eight. So pretty significant. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about the appreciation of the, of the, these tier one rights themselves in this marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, I think many of our listeners are aware that even as cord cutting has increased or as you know, our ratings for uh, linear cable television have, have decreased that live sports is basically still like the only cord cutting proof uh, mm -hmm. content out there. And so, and those rights outside of very small uh, collegiate sports or really niche brands have continued to increase. Uh, we have uh, both, we have reported and we have seen others in the industry report that in this next round of the next decade, maybe some, new brands or new entities enter this marketplace, whether that's NBC Sports, which has mostly been a niche player potentially getting involved, whether that's CBS Sports uh, trying to re recapture some of their, their lost inventory or potentially Apple or potentially Amazon or, or some other entity. When you look at your projections of the, the increasing value of these rights, are you pricing in a uh, marketplace with more bidders or do you think that even if it's just the same three or four companies that would sustain this level of price increase yeah largely in our forecasts we what we've seen as, is the annual growth rate of these tv deals for the last call it 20 years or so has been pretty steady in the five to seven percent range and so when we think about you know normal normal cost of goods, not in an inflationary period, you're thinking of like three to 4%. So think of the linear TV marketplace, maybe being two X kind of the normal rise in prices of anything else, um, which is pretty strong, right? And I think they've just had a lot of forces working in its favor, multiple bidders in linear, the transition from linear to digital. Now the digital need to potentially overspend for rights to kind of get in the door and they're competing against legacy linear. And eventually we're gonna have legacy digital competing against new entrant metaverse, right? So it's kind of like, there's always this good blend of equal parts, legacy players and new entrants, which is really nice for, for sports. Um, but when you think about people like Apple and um, Amazon and Google, what's interesting about their business models is that they are selling you a lot more things, right. Than Fox is selling you or ESPN. Yeah. They're selling you products. I mean, Amazon, 90% of what this house buys is from Amazon. And I think that's probably the case with a lot of households, right? So Amazon has a lot more interest in getting you as a customer, I would think than an ESPN who is really just selling you more content. Um, same with, uh, you know, and, but that kind of changes with Disney, right? Now there's 
theme parks and cruise ships and other movies and things they want to get you to do. So all that to say, I think the tech giants that are playing in the space, these rights may be worth more to them than um, the legacy players because they just have more to sell and more money to um, activate appropriately and really make these deals work out for them. So yes, a lot of forces really in sports favor and a good one is the equal parts legacy and new entrants seemingly at every turn. I'd be curious to kind of get your thoughts. Speaking of that, obviously, Big Ten rights are kind of first on on the chopping block here, and, and we anticipate them going to the market uh, this summer and, and having those discussions already with a lot of their partners. Um, what is kind of Navigate's outlook for, for the Big Ten? You obviously, I think, have generated headlines from, from this release uh, in, in terms of the SEC passing them, but uh, what kind of market can the Big Ten expect, and, and what kind of numbers do you guys uh, anticipate them being able to get? Yeah, um, good questions. I think in our projections – um, what we had is, you know, today the Big Ten's in the 50 to 60 per school range. And we kind of see, um, you know, their next round of deals happening. Um, I think after the 2023, well, everything's kind of off a year with how everything flows out. But after their next round of deals, um, we see that, you know, kind of jumping up to in the 70 range 70 million plus per school so we see i mean a great marketplace for the big 10 it's 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 in the middle of the country where there aren't a lot of pro sports and you see that passion in their numbers you see the attendance something that is really hard for um for people to get lately in sports is that in-person fan and the big 10 is sort of leading in attendance and being there in person which is next level passion so i think a lot of people see that um, so they're not, you know, they're not going anywhere They they're going to be right there with the sec. And, you know, I will say a little caveat to the forecasting that we do is we also are, are forecasting performance of these leagues on the field. And those are sort of embedded into the numbers, right? Because there are pieces, you know, CFP has certain schools and certain schools get that money, right. And the, certain schools make the NCAA tournament advance to different rounds, those units get paid out differently in sort of a rolling six year thing and other bowl games pay out. So there's a lot of other pieces kind of linked to success. And so if the big 10 is takes steps forward and, you know, they are the final four and they are making it to the CFP and, and doing all these things, there's chance for them to close that gap. But we still look at them as a really healthy conference and um, with a bright future, just right there with the SEC, to be honest. I'm glad you mentioned the basketball component because it, it's very clear that it's foot college football that drives the realignment bus. It's college football that drives the, per, the, 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 is the dominant factor in tier one rights valuations, but leagues can make money in other ways with NCAA unit payouts uh, potentially being significant. I, I know when, when I look at the, that, the reimagined big 12 conference, uh, that, that's not going to be a league that, right now projects to be competing for college football championships, but by many metrics, it's already the best college basketball league mm -hmm. in the country. And mm -hmm. they are replacing an average Oklahoma program with really good BYU and Cincinnati. And, and I mean, Houston might is in the sweet 16 right now. It, it, when we look at the, at these, at these numbers, how much is the new big 12s basketball performance, a factor in their financial health projection over the next decade? Yeah, great question. I think, um, you know, in the technical model modeling of this, we don't have uh, an equal part forecast for basketball that we do football, just because to your point, it's 80, 85% of the revenue that schools are getting. But what I will say is that of all of the conferences we look at today, the smallest share of revenue um, that is football in our forecast is in the big 12. So that piece of the pie for the big 12 that's from other sports is larger than the piece of pie for the other five. And it's because of everything kind of you're pointing out. We looked historically at what revenue levels have been for that conference and how that is matched up against their TV numbers. And there's that extra bucket of revenue that is making up more of their, uh, of their pie than, than other conferences. So, I think they're seeing it and feeling it. And, you know, look, the conferences, 
if conferences can get even more creative, I think basketball is a place to do that. If you want to get more eyeballs on a product, think, you know, not every game even makes it on national TV in the big 12 because that they have their deal with ESPN plus and put it on there. And so imagine preseason conference tournaments uh, matching up with postseason, or you have a round Robin near in the middle of the season that disrupts like an NBA product or an all-star game or whatever it is. Um, I think there's enough inventory and enough interest, especially in big 12 basketball to maybe do something creative and unique and take even more steps and leverage into that. I think that's a great point worth bringing up. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. We have, we've already seen some mid major and low major leagues, but you try to try to do something similar for their broadcast partners. I, I guess on, on that note, and I realize this is outside the scope of your paper. So it's okay if the answer is, I don't know. But so much so much of our audience for going for two and on Connect and for extra points are administrators and fans of mid-major programs. And I'm wondering here if, if through your course of study and looking at what things are going to look like for the Big Ten or the Big 12 or the ACC, if there are takeaways that you might have about the value of media rights or the financial trajectory for G5 or potentially mm-hmm. even one AAA programs that uh, are not going to get fifty million dollars from a, a a legacy linear company in the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this at Navigate um, among sort of our more college sports fans, and you know, our what we said we would do is if we were say a commissioner of one of the G five, so they call them, you know, conferences, maybe just take a hard look at where you're at and where you think you want to be and who you compete against and the realistic chances of, of getting where you want to be if we stay the status quo. And if, and if you think those objectives are achieved through an expanded playoff and being part of this system that I think is overwhelmingly rewarding big 10 sec and the other three conferences, Um, that's totally fine. I think if that's where you want to be, there's plenty of money in it and plenty of success and happy student athletes and happy schools and enrollment bumps. And you get those, um, Cinderella seasons to, to really make a splash and just look at Cincinnati last year, pretty amazing stuff. Right. So there's a, there's a lot there to be gained and enjoy. Um, but if there's appetite for something different, there may be other models that um, reward them more financially than they are today. And we've talked about, think of, an, think of a system where maybe all of them kind of bond together and say, let's put together this super conference of different divisions of these G5 schools and let's make it a, a product that is very attractive to student athletes first, maybe even to name, image, and likeness rights second, maybe then to digital TV partners third, almost reprioritize how you're structured to be more for the future than the past. And um, who knows what comes out of that type of alignment. It could be something fans really go after and want to see. And um, But, you know, there are pros and cons to every model, but we think there might be some, there might be a greener pasture if everybody got together and sort of creatively thought through something else. But again, there's plenty to do and plenty to um, plenty of rewards to reap under the current system and, and kind of seeing how things play out status quo too. So we don't, we don't blame anyone for taking, for taking that route too. We're just a little bit more, um, you know, aggressive thinkers from the outside looking in, right. It's easy to say versus to do, you know, yeah, it is. And, you know, it's interesting. You also include in here in terms of structure, you know, the Pac-12, they have maybe the most unique rights, you know, arrangement coming mm-hmm. to come not only their first, second and third tier rights, but marketing rights, all that is, is the Pac-12 just maybe the greatest unknown in, in, in terms of making a big jump, staying flat, staying low. I mean, how, how do you guys kind of sense the market for the Pac-12 and mm-hmm. not only where, where they're at, but kind of where they're where they're going with the new commissioner and, and a new probably strategy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great question. It's such an interesting conference, right? It's almost like they were the first to sort of be innovative in owning their own rights and first to be innovative in splintering them, but then pulling them back and then owning them. Um, And so you don't have to look back very far to see where the Pac-12 was getting more than any other conference per year, kind of that first round of TV deals. But I think what is sort of... um, 
hurting them lately, and I don't think they would argue either, is performance and um, interest in collegiate sports. So many pro sports franchises kind of moving out of, um, you know, other regions into Pac-12 territory, almost diluting fans at a time that you'd want them to be more passionate. So they're kind of battling the apathy crowd with the Gen Z crowd that, you know, younger people have different interests, right? And they're, they're sort of, we always talk about Silicon Valley being like looking into the future. Well, the future is sort of Gen Z appetite for sport, which is light, it's short broadcast, maybe just highlights, more esports, more soccer, um, things like that. So they're battling from a couple fronts there. But what makes them an unknown is just the fact that they have all of those rights bundled in and that they're really truly living the model of one plus one could equal three if done correctly. So um, with Apple, doing what they're doing, Amazon doing what they're doing, them being in Silicon Valley. They're kind of the forefront of a lot of name, image, and likeness concepts as well. Um, maybe they uh, kind of do what I talked about that the G5 could do, but do it at, with a more powerful flock of schools to kind of reimagine what this could look like instead of just going with, you know, a typical legacy player for the next round of deals. Um, but yeah, good unknown is a good way to put it, I think. I, you know, speaking of unknowns, I, the, the, the terrible joke that I keep using whenever people ask me about crystal ball stuff, as I say, yeah. my newsletter would cost a lot more than eight bucks a month if my crystal ball was, was, was perfect. Mm -hmm. Clearly, yours isn't either. And, and, right. But in the interest of transparency, I appreciate it. As you said, these are the assumptions that we baked into our model to get to this level, right? We extrapolated the, the current trend, historical growth rates for college and pro sports media deals. Our model estimates a playoff of eight rather than 12. We are, our model projects X, Y, and Z. We don't take into account variables X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, other than the number of teams in the college football playoff, is there a particular baked, baked in assumption that you guys use when you look at this model to say like, you know, we are maybe the least confident that this assumption is true. Or if this assumption changes, that might have the biggest impact on this model. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. I think what comes to mind for me is the way that CFP kind of pays out today and what's included. So it's the New Year Six and the actual playoff. Um, and the New Year's Six deal was sort of first, and then the playoff was kind of added. And it's not super clear that the way that was done was sort of ad hoc values. So saying that the New Year's Six is worth what that's paid, and it's separately the CFP is worth what that deal was announced as. So it's almost, we, we made the assumption that those things together are worth a certain amount per viewer, and then broke down per viewer what that's worth and everything else. And then with a 12 team playoff, it's really replacing. We're, we're assuming that those New Year's six games become part of the playoff as opposed to being brand new games in a lot of ways. And so I think there's a there's an assumption of, you know, how does the New Year's six play into a 12 team and how are um, you know, how do the ESPNs of the world look at a New Year's Six game as opposed to a CFP. Do they look at viewers the same or not? Why or why not? So I think, you know, we'll never have the inner workings of, of the thought process for those numbers, but those are the benchmarks we have. So we ran with those, but that's a curious one to me. And I think the most important is just what we've talked about is that, you know, I said, to start that we always had good equal parts, legacy brands bidding on these and digital entrance. But now it does feel, it does really feel like a tipping point, right? When you've got Apple actually really truly spending money and Amazon the same with the NFL, maybe they come in and change the entire, um, you know, the entire marketplace for what an average viewer is worth. Because again, you know, 90% of what I buy is from Amazon, not from ESPN. And so who knows what I'm worth as an incremental new Amazon customer to them. My lifetime value to Amazon has to be a lot higher than it is to ESPN or to Google or to Apple, right? So um, that's another thing. We're just kind of saying these mark this marketplace continues as we've seen. 
Um, but if COVID, COVID taught us anything, sports is sort of the one thing keeping us all together and sane. And it's keeping live content um, important to consumers. And it seems like the people with the deepest pockets are recognizing that and they could change the game entirely. And we're not assuming that at all. We're assuming it's sort of business as usual, you know? Speaking of business as usual, you have a note in here that uh, you, for the ACC projections in particular, that uh, the ACC network would reach full distribution in, in 2023. Uh, I, I'm curious how you guys kind of look at the conference network marketplace. Do you anticipate because of core cutting, because there are fewer subscribers that uh, are ultimately uh, getting these channels, that uh, just the, the subscriber fees are kind of making up for for that uh, as we go into the future? And ultimately, how, how much could a direct-to-consumer uh, you know, offering by either ESPN or Fox or whatnot of these networks? Of, of potential rights kind of change your projections as well. Yeah, that's a great call out too. And I think with that one, you know, it, there were some numbers that were made public that kind of said, we think each school will get this much more per year because of this Comcast deal. So that was easy to just sort of forecast through here. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the local RSN type of model is a tricky one. And, um, you know, the, the viewership is declining. The fees are increasing. It seems like there's a lot of headwinds disrupting there. But um, I think what's what's interesting is that there are a lot of opportunities too, to to capitalize on. And that, that could be, you know, sports betting stuff. And I know it's not a, it, in the collegiate space, you're even seeing more and more schools have um, sports betting sponsorships and partnerships and things like that. So it is becoming more commonplace, but leaning into that a little bit as a piece of content to drive engagement to those back to those networks, I think is good. You're seeing rights kind of get bundled together. You're hearing ideas of let's create, you know, think of a red zone type of network where you've got access to a lot of different teams content at once. And I've said it a couple of times, but those are really one plus one equals three type of scenarios where you're bundling things together that no one's ever seen or um, had to buy before. And if you're engaging at a new level, that's a new revenue tier that we're kind of tapping into. So I think, I think there, the challenges are there and you're seeing that with um, RSN deals, not really growing all that quickly anymore and subscribers dropping. Um, but there's, this is a fun time because, uh, again, COVID told us, taught us all that if we don't have that sense of community within sports, especially locally, um, we kind of feel empty. Um, and there's a lot of new fun engagement opportunities that are um, kind of hitting the market and being capitalized on. So we see it as a you know, I wouldn't, if we had to do a buy, sell, hold, right, and categorize local ratings, we'd probably put them at a hold right now, as opposed to a sell or a buy, but certainly tier one um, national uh, as a, as a buy. Um, and every, and nothing in our purview looks to be in a sell position, especially when it comes to sports media rights. So that's kind of what we're, how we're seeing things. Uh, Matt, this is this has been really uh, enlightening. I, I appreciate it. Uh, you taking some time to chat with us, Brian. Did, did you have anything else that you wanted to make sure to ask before we uh, we let Matt go? No, I just uh, I think we we should turn it over to uh, to you, Matt, just to see where where people can find the study and, and certainly the additional work that uh, Navigate is, is putting out on this space. That's a Matt. Great point, sure. Ryan. Great point. So in the show notes, we will include a link here that, that's on nvgt.com uh, with the, the link to the actual study that will, of course, also be in the show notes on Extra Points, which is a pretty good newsletter that I think you should be subscribing to. Um, and Navigate has, has been uh, very helpful with us across Collegiate Sports Connect uh, and the D1 Ticker family of publications and sharing some of their analytical research. Uh, Matt, thank you again for your time. We'll make sure that people see this, uh, see your, your little white paper. Uh, I'm sure we'll be chatting again some other time next time uh, Navigate puts something else out. Sounds great. Thanks again for the time, guys. It was a lot of fun. All right. Take care. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that conversation, but, you know, it, it, the, the kind of the, the tail end of that reminded me of another conversation. Uh, interview that we had on Collegiate Sports Connect earlier this week, too. I, I had a chance to talk with uh, Rochelle Paul, who is the 
athletic director at St. Peter's, uh, which is, uh, as I understand it now, is, you, you've heard of this place, right? It's the most famous school now in the entire country. Um, especially in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, I hear. Especially in, especially in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, where we are technically headquartered, the most popular institution there. Uh, we, you know, we were talking about a, a lot of things that happen when you're a tiny school that no one's ever heard of, and suddenly you're in the Sweet 16, you beat a bunch of behemoths. We're talking about, hey, you know, what are uh, some of the, the new corporate activations that, that happen when you do this? So you start hearing from companies that maybe you pitched four or five times and they didn't take your calls and now they do and she's and you know she's telling me look this is this is ongoing it's definitely already happening i'm sure you've seen what peacock did to go take our cheerleaders to the, to this event and she said and we've, we've seen a lot of explosion in the apparel space companies we haven't worked with before like uh i don't know if you've heard of this company it's called homefield apparel and i was like homefield apparel as a matter of fact i have heard of them because they are the title sponsor of this program home field apparel brings you the most comfortable the most unique interesting officially licensed collegiate apparel uh, t-shirts hoodies crewnecks doggers which are joggers with a a dog with existential depression on them um you bringing in the vintage logos and vintage prints from colleges across the country this week they added saint peter's and you of course know what the mascot is for saint peter's university right what is it, the the peacocks? It's the peacocks. What could be better that, that makes them? I think the platonic ideal of the mid major up uh, sweet sixteen darling. Because you have okay, here's a school that nobody uh, more than twenty miles outside of the university has heard of. Check. Um, what is, is it? A school that beat a gigantic blue blood that is wildly disliked across the country. Check. Sorry, Kentucky. Nobody likes you. Um, we're a Louisville company. Do they have a ridiculous and unique mascot? Yes. Baby blue peacocks, not the banana slugs, but it's like the next best thing. Do they have a star player with unique and recognizable facial hair? Check. I literally do not know how you could have drawn this up any better. The home field collection for St. Peter's um, has the strut of destiny, uh, angry marching peacock. You have the beautiful Heather blue. you got the peacock nation. Um, and this was all turned around very quickly. We're actually going to talk to some people at home field uh, in a couple of episodes about how you actually execute this for a, a major moment here with mid-majors. But we, you know you've got the UCLA, you've got the Gonzaga. I'm wearing a, wearing a BYU shirt here today um, because most of my uh, wardrobe comes from home field. But you can get all the St. Peter's stuff too, um, which you should do because it's beautiful, especially if you don't have any other blue shirts in your life. Uh, I ran to go buy the the Strut of Destiny one so quickly. Like uh, I cannot wait for that to actually get in. Uh, but uh, yes, that was not only on 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 brand in terms of home field to turn the thing around, but I, just just a great look to the t shirt. And uh, I I cannot wait to wear it. Uh, hopefully they will make it uh, in, in time for the actual games because uh, yeah. you know, if, if if you if you're gonna rep the Peacocks, you might as well do it right. Uh, unquestionably. I, I, I want to say they've sold over 500 of these things within like 48 hours, which when you consider that St. Peter's has an enrollment of like 3000 students on a good day, that's, that's a pretty big deal. They, they basically, you know, picked up a fifth of the entire student body in, in terms of T-shirt sales. You can join that group by using promo code extra points at checkout to save 15%. And if you're thinking, well, Matt, I've already bought home field stuff. So that promo code doesn't work for me anymore. Um, they have another promo code that I'm going to get here in just a second because I'm a serious professional and I already had this pulled up ahead of time. Here it is. Use promo code mania to get an additional 10% off any team collection that won a game this weekend. So if you're at Ohio State, well, you can't do Ohio State because uh, they're not on there, but almost everybody, almost everybody else is. If you're uh, a Michigan fan, you could use Mania, save some money on your Michigan stuff. You could use Mania, save some money on this new St. Uh, St. Peter stuff, your Gonzaga stuff, your UCLA stuff. Um, if you're a fan of a home field school that lost in the first round, sorry you went to such a crappy school. Maybe you should have done a little bit better on your ACT. Then you wouldn't have needed, you would have had a high paying job. You wouldn't need this discount code. But for the rest of you, extra points on your first order. Use Mania to 10% on the, the teams that have actually won. And then I'm going to also just mention this real quick one last time. For my friends who work in athletic departments, if you have not reached out to home field and gotten your school on this list, what are you waiting for? Look at all the great publicity St. Peter's is getting. And I'll tell you guys, literally last week, Connor, this is for you. Uh, 
we, we got a school that is not currently uh, a home field school that listened to our show, reached out to me and said, I want to become a home field school. Can you please make the introduction? We made it happen. When that school was announced, I will not shut up about it. I will absolutely take credit for it. But listen, don't let that one school have all of the fun and good press. You can join too. My email is matt at extrapointsmb.com. All right. That was a hell of an ad read. Uh, Brian, what, 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 did you, what did you make of all of this? I uh, very much appreciate that Navigate is very wide, very open about here are the assumptions that we're making. Clearly, a lot of these things here can change. I definitely am on board with the general trajectory, uh, I think, of where they have these various conferences here. Like, I, I definitely think the SEC is going to be number one in the decade. Definitely think the Big Ten will be, will be close or maybe a little bit higher. Definitely think there's going to be a big gap between the other three. Uh, but a whole lot can change in the, in the last couple of next couple of years, right? Oh, absolutely. I think that when you when you look at the chart and, and you see kind of the big two separating themselves from a pack so widely, I, I think that is the kind of eye opener. That's certainly what a lot of fans, you know, navigated to. Uh, you know, no, no pun intended, but like yeah. when, when that chart came out, everybody was like, "Look at these two. And you got to keep in mind those were per school payout. So you're talking about uh, that pie being split an additional, you know, extra number of ways. When you're talking about the Big Twelve, you know, having 14 teams, obviously the SEC is adding Oklahoma and Texas. So uh, it's not just that the the pie is 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 way bigger but uh, even those splits uh, compared to what they are right now are, are getting even bigger and um you know you when you're talking about 100 plus million dollars worth of of you know revenue coming in from the conference you know that's going to have second order effects not just in football which obviously is the, is the biggest driver but we're seeing yeah. it now in terms of basketball hires and you know, look at look at all these deals i mean obviously you know you speak lsu maybe a little different category given the ncaa hovering over their program but you know handing out eight-year deals you know to, to basketball coaches you know that is something that other other schools and other conferences probably not in a position to do so you know even at the power five level and i think that's it's, it's going to be even more interesting to see as we navigate things with the UN transition nil continuing to evolve you know, how, how much of, of these media rights are, are going to be, um, you know, really at the disposal of a lot of these ADs in terms of those other sports? This is a great question. And on one hand, I I completely agree. And I think particularly within the SEC, we can see a straight line between we've gotten gobs more money and actually investing that into things that are not just football. Women's basketball, I think, is, is the prime example. We've talked about this on Connect and on the show and on, and on some other episodes here about how that has helped fuel increase in salaries, increased investment in, in there. I, uh, men's and women's swimming is another example. Volleyball, it's happening. But it's I will- huge. But, yeah, and it was already huge too, but that, that's, that, that's accelerated, right? But I think it's also worth pointing out, do you remember the last time an SEC team won the men's basketball championship? Uh, I'm going to go with, um, this is a bad question because I'm, I'm, my memory is, is, is shady, but I'm going to, I guess, uh, Kentucky, 2015, 2016, whatever it, it was. It was 2012, Kentucky. It's been a decade. It's been, tw I think, twice as long uh, since a, a Big Ten team has done it. I mean, 2002, if you want to count Maryland, when they definitely weren't in the Big Ten, 2000 uh, for Michigan State. The ACC, despite being pretty far down this list has won championships in, uh, in baseball. It's won championships in lacrosse. Uh, it's it, at least for Clemson has still been able to compete at a national level. Uh, the big, and, and, and so has the, the, so is the big 12. You're defending national champion right now, Baylor. Um, the best basketball men's basketball conference this season was the big 12. And so the, the, I, I say this to think like, un, yes, if this money trickles down into other sports, will the Big Ten and the SEC, particularly the SEC, because I think they're historically more, more apt to spend big money, will that help their performance in sports when they decide that's important? Yeah, I definitely think that that's true. I would, If the SEC says we care about lacrosse now, they're going to kick people's ass in lacrosse, I think, if they decide to spend that money. But as I said this several multiple other times, there's a diminishing returns point to the value of money. Um, and if you are well coached and you have enough money, you can still compete nationally in college football without having anywhere close to this revenue share. And you can have all this revenue share. And if your coach sucks and if your athletic department and your boosters and your NIL collective and your governor and everybody else can't get on the same page, there's no TV check that's going to help you. Otherwise, Texas would be good. Texas is not good. Texas, I mean, maybe they'll be good this year. I mean, we've done this song and dance before. Uh, and, and other programs would be successful. The Big Ten would win more if, if that was the case. So if you are a Pac-12 fan or an ACC fan, I wouldn't necessarily freak out about this. It's not like we get a dividend check if the Big Ten revenue exceeds expectations. 
it's not like any of these schools are adding more sports. Um, they just, they're, they're not using, they're not choosing to spend that money that way. So on one hand, I, I get it. On the other hand, who cares <laughs> at, at, at some point, maybe a $30 million gap is so big that that, that that changes things, but I don't see a ton of evidence to suggest that if you don't work in this field, this matters that much. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I think it's it's a real concern. You know, if if you talk with the Pac-12 AD and you're just seeing these numbers, and oh, there's, there's... I, I know I know they're concerned. I know anybody whose paycheck, and this is not a pejorative. If this is your world. Of course, you're concerned. It's one thing for me to sit here because my you know my check's cash. No matter what happens with Navigate, I can look at a chart. I don't care if my department budget rested on on me having to be able to beat Ole Miss. Yeah, of course I'd be pooping my pants. Like I, I, that's that's not unjustifiable. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no worries. No. But you know the, the interesting too. The interesting thing too for for me is is well is you, you look at these these massive numbers, right? Does that kind of change the formula for how these athletic departments are taking in money, distributing money? Like you, you look at the SEC. Let's let's face it. You know they're they're the conference in uh, the, generating the most headlines, right? In the NIL collective space, right? Uh, if if these athletic departments are are getting a hundred plus million dollars or, or so uh, in terms of their media rights, are they asking donors less? Uh, to, to make those ask for facilities upgrades, for a new locker room, for uh, just general giving uh, to cover coaches' salaries because they're getting that from the media rights aspect. You know, is, is, and then are those do dollars in turn from those boosters uh, going towards the players more? You know, and, and maybe is it going towards the players more in the SEC versus the Big Ten versus the Pac-12, which is, you know, obviously they, they're going to need every single dollar that they have in order to help close this gap. So I think uh, we, we hit upon it with with the college football playoff and that unknown of the distribution um, from that CFP and, and what it might look like. I know that was a huge concern for, for George Klyovkov, the Pac-12 commissioner, in terms of signing things and, and expanding the playoff without yeah. really knowing how many dollars you're going to get, what the percentage revenue a cut is and, and all that sort of thing. I, I think that and, and how the pie is really divided up and, and on, on the inside and, and going out as well. Um, that, that is going to be an intriguing thing, I think, for a lot of ADs uh, to kind of look at over the coming years as well as fans because, um, you know, your dollar, whether it's uh, in, a, in a seat or, on, on, you know, subscribing the cable, um, it could go to a variety of different things depending on what the conference is and, and based on those, those early first and second tier deals. That is a great point. And you and I both already know of some athletic directors who are shifting their strategic priorities away from facility construction, knowing that it will benefit the department more if that goes towards NIL stuff or goes to anything that's more directly facing athletes. I guess, I guess the last thing in, in retrospect, but maybe I should have asked about this, but the other gigantic unknown over the next decade isn't just media consumer behavior. Uh, and who decide what brands decide to be involved in this space? It's also what is it? What are the courts going to say about athlete compensation? It's already kind of a farce to pretend that the the fifty plus million dollar a year television deal is amateur athletics when that doubles, and when we have two or three other cases go in front of district court or potentially the National Labor Relations Board, that could change a lot. And if you're making a hundred million bucks from your conference distributions, I think you're going to be able to figure out a way to pay the players, even if you have to pay the field hockey team. But that might be where the, a payroll gap could become more significant than it is right now. I, mean, I don't you can already see it, right? You know, when as soon as the Big Ten announces their multi-billion dollar deal, you're gonna have somebody from Congress, some representative, some senator say, you know, well, why are we doing this? Let's let's hold some hearings, right? And, and they're gonna go down that road and we're gonna kind of start that cycle again, right? Of of just uh, looking into at college sports, what what can what can be changed on, on, on a national level, what can be changed uh, in terms of the courts. I mean, we already saw uh, a, a new challenge, you know, in, in terms of the, the courts uh, just this past weekend. So uh, I mean it, it is a a ever-changing space and there's a lot of landmines out there but let's face it as you, these numbers can prove uh there's also a lot of money in it yeah i'm, I'm operating the, on the assumption that there will be a republican controlled federal government when the big 10 deal is announced but i could be wrong who knows and, and if you know maybe, maybe bernie sanders decides to do one of these things anyway i i i don't know those are conversations, I think, for other podcasts, for other newsletters, for other videos. And friends, you're in luck because we make a bunch of those. Uh, Brian and I have been very busy this week producing videos for Collegiate Sports Connect, which is completely for free. Um, 
You could find all of the interviews that we're doing. I have talked to athletic directors at St. Peter's at Florida Gulf Coast. Uh, we've talked to uh, to folks that are looking to uh, they're looking to hire people. We've talked to, to folks involved in the collective space. Brian just interviewed somebody involved with collectives at the University of Virginia. Uh, we uh, had an interview recently about the women's basketball coaching carousel. So you can find all of that. And you could also find what we're producing at Extra Points publishes every, uh, not every single day. I take the weekends off. Mondays through Fridays, we pro it, it produces a, a newsletter with original reporting with unique analysis on everything from small college conference realignment to Navy image likeness to college sports history. Uh, we had uh, some, some really, I think, interesting, unique stuff about what actually happens to mid-majors when, when they win and what is sustainable and what does that do for ticket prices? What does that do for their ability to hire other coaches? It's nerd stuff. And I know you like nerd stuff because you've been listening to this podcast for the last 40 minutes. So you can find all of that at extrapointsmb.com. Brian, if I've forgotten to plug anything, I feel like I've been a good company man here. You have done a, an excellent job as, as a company man. Just make sure if you're out there, rate, review, and subscribe if uh, if you are able to. I know Spotify is, is as does you know ratings now. Make sure you, you subscribe if you're subscribed through that app. Uh, give us give us five stars. Of course, it always helps if you're on an Apple Podcast. We're on YouTube now. You know, like if, if you want to see our our beautiful shining faces or simply just what kind of home filled shirt we're we're wearing right now. Um, yeah. You know, go jump on YouTube on the on the D1 ticker page. Uh, we we have a playlist of all our past episodes, uh, interviews like this as well. There's there's a ton coming uh, in that space, as you mentioned, on Collegiate Sports Connect. So uh, exciting times uh, here in college athletics, not just with the men's and women's basketball tournaments. Uh, you, you had uh, hockey just wrapped up, uh, women's yeah. hockey just wrapped up. Uh, That's Frozen right, women's Island. hockey did. And who won the women's hockey national champion? D, Ohio State University. That's right. Women's hockey school, women's basketball school, synchronized swimming school, Pistol, I'm, I'm probably forgetting something. The, the point is nothing that happened during the men's basketball tournament could hurt me because I got to watch my alma mater win a national championship, which is pretty cool, in my opinion. Always special, always special. Always special, uh, just like episodes of this podcast. Thanks so much, everyone, for, for uh, following along with us. We have some more guests and some other uh, fun things on this show lined up soon. Uh, until next time, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for following along. We'll see you on the internet.